Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to um, SACME Virtual Journal Club. Today we are talking about preparation for future learning. Um, I will be facilitating uh, this uh, session today and uh, I'm really thrilled to introduce the man who needs no introduction in these circles in particular, Dr. Don Moore from uh, Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt. Uh, before we do that, I just want to mention a couple of uh, things and, and housekeeping notes. So for those of you who have participated in the past, uh, you know um, that we um, do a bit of a presentation that our presenter will uh, do for us. Uh, today we have chosen an article uh, by Maria Miopoulos and colleagues from the Wilson Center. And um, so Don will um, review the major points for us and then we'll launch into a uh, discussion and questions. There are several ways you can engage uh, with, uh, with this material and with the group. And um, ideally you would just raise your hand and I will then ask, uh, call your name and ask you to uh, contribute. Or if you um, are more of a shy nature or would like to uh, communicate in different ways, you can pose a question online. So there's a question section and you can just type your question in and it will go to us, uh, to, to, to me, and then I can answer that or ask the question for you. Um, the other way to engage is potentially to use the chat function. That is something that's uh, visible to all participants. So um, that is really um, what I had to say. I would like to ask you to um, to be on mute. I mean, you are muted automatically, so you don't have to worry about that. And um, without further ado, let me then um, allow Don to do his wonderful work. Don, welcome. Thank you very much, Mila. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to uh, work with the, this group and um, also to uh, make some comments on this uh, very important article. Um, so, so these are the points that I hope to cover uh, today. Uh, what I intend to do is to uh, make a short presentation uh, before uh, discussion to kind of frame uh, what we'll be uh, talking about. Uh, partially because I think that this article um, draws on several other articles that this group has been involved in and they don't really explain that in the article itself. And I think it, at least when I first read it I was hunting around for some of the connections that they were making and so I followed up on some of the references. So I think uh, there are six items that I have identified uh, in terms of points that will be covered. First, uh, they have suggested, or they have some evidence that suggests that clinicians may not be learning effectively from all facets of their practices. In other words, what they say is that they have not been prepared for future learning. And, and they also claim that the assumptions that underlie the self-regulating learner uh, in CME and CPD are faulty. Um, they've defined uh, preparation for future learning as uh, the capacity to learn new information, use resources effectively, and to invent new strategies for learning and problem solving. And I've added that supports the use of adaptive expertise in novel circumstances. Uh, they suggest that practice embedded learning activities uh, contribute to the ability to use adaptive expertise in practice settings. And they talk a little bit about the instructional conditions that promote preparation for future learning. And I'm going to just touch, touch on one of those uh, uh, instructional conditions. And um, they, they conclude their article with suggestions for moving forward. So let, let me start. Um, in their article in 2008 in the JSEP, um, which is entitled, uh, well, it's Learning in Practice, From Practice, About Practice. Um, and they basically have it, I've described uh, the situation in which they feel that continuing education has constructed an image of the self, 
self-regulating professional and the learning activities in which he or she typically uh, engages to maintain competence. And they've drawn on the article that Hanfield Jones published in Medical Education in 2007. Uh, and those and the six activities that's involved or that the self-regulating uh, professional is presumed to engage in are regular self-reflection on practice, recognition that performance in one of those areas in practice does not meet a standard, that the recognition of the gap leads to a decision uh, to seek opportunities for improvement, to engage uh, in learning activities that address the gap and learn how to address it, uh, what is learned is then transferred to practice, and uh, performance measures uh, are performance is measured again uh, to determine if performance meets the standard. Um, and what their claim is that many of the cognitive mechanisms which are assumed to underlie and support this self-regulatory process are questionable at best. And so um, I think this is this article is their first reference that they use. So. I think there is a lot of assumptions in their article itself that uh, they draw on that I thought it was important to point out. And here are the assumptions that they claim in the self-regulating learner model are not, uh, are not or are, are faulty. First of all, professionals naturally reflect on their own performance for the purposes of highlighting their weaknesses and gaps. And as we know uh, from Joan Sargent's work and other people's work as well, that practitioners will simply ignore or discount feedback that they might get that's inconsistent with what they think about their own abilities. The second uh, assumption is that professionals self-assess their own weaknesses when they do try to look for them. And there's been a lot of work on, um, on the ability of students, practitioners, and people in general uh, to self-assess and the, the, general, the general conclusion that uh, the ability is very weak, starting with Kruger's work in 1999 and uh, Dave and Paul and others' work in uh, 2006. Uh, the third assumption that they think is uh, 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 an issue is pro uh, professionals try to redress weaknesses through learning when they identify them. And so uh, Steve Miller, uh, who was with the ABMS when he wrote this article, suggests that the identification of a particular weakness is seldom a motivation for attending uh, CE activities. And we all realize, I'm sure, that health professionals more often than not attend a CE activity to reinforce what they already know. Part of the reason behind all that, of course, is that if you identified something that's uh, a weakness, it's very difficult for you to engage in a learning activity. It's just hard work, and that may be part of the issue there as well. And finally, uh, professionals effectively incorporate new knowledge uh, acquired in educational settings into practice. If nothing else, this is probably the biggest issue in CME, CPD these days. Um, and as Dave in 1995 and uh, in 2007 pointed out, and many others have as well, uh, that there's little evidence that what is learned in an educational setting is transferred into practice. So my reaction to this was we, ought, we know all this and that um, many of us are working on each one of these assumptions and others in addition to create a situation where uh, a self-regulating, self-directed learner uh, is a functional kind of concept in CME CPD, um, but their but their points are well taken, and I think in the context of what they're trying to get us to think about in terms of preparation for future learning, these are right on target. Um, so they do admit that and, and physicians do engage in the process of learning in the context of their daily practice, and as problems in practice emer emerge, they address them, but they're concerned that um, the way they're being addressed at this point in time is what they call practice drift. If you can think of a, of a, of a small boat when its motor conks out and it's sort of floating around in the bay without any sort of direction, I think that's the kind of uh, metaphor that they wanted to create. 
and sometimes this leads to what they say is inappropriate shortcuts, erroneous approaches, rather than to true practice improvements. So we, as CME professionals, CPD professionals, we know that there are significant professional practice gaps in healthcare. And part of it may be due to the fact that the improvements or the reactions to novel presentations and surprises in practice is more of a practice drift than the intentional kind of learning that the model, self-regulating model, presumed. And so I think what they're trying to get us to think about more than anything is learning about practice, in practice, and through practice. And I think that's a very important concept that would help us as we go forward in our efforts to improve CME. I'm sorry, I'm getting this, getting the slide order not, uh, not correct. Anyway, um, many of much of the experienced practitioners' daily practice has less to do with solving problems than remembering solutions. I really like that statement. I think it's right on target, and it's supported by some of the work that Jeff Norman has done over the years and his colleagues. Um, that clinicians do develop a strong body of patient case knowledge. I think we all understand that. So clinicians then draw on this case-based knowledge to use system one reasoning to match patterns stored in memory with the presentations of patients. This is an intuitive approach that relies on inductive knowledge. Uh, that's Cross Carey's work. Some of you may be familiar with his work. And this has been referred to as routine expertise. But when a clinician encounters a novel patient presentation or a surprise by unexpected results of a patient ma uh, management approach that has always worked for him or her, he or she resorts to system two reasoning. And this is much more uh, an analytical approach. Um, you've heard um, the uh, comments that, this, that uh, physicians need to slow down at a certain point when they uh, encounter something that they are not clear about what they need to do next. And that's exactly what Cross Carey uh, came up with with uh, his System 2 approach. And it relies on abductive reasoning more than uh, inductive reasoning. And abductive reasoning is, is, is um, making inferences from incomplete information and moving on to the next level and then making those same kind of inferences again. So this approach is used in a situation that really requires adaptive expertise. And what, what the preparation for future learning does for an individual, it gives them the capacity to be able to adaptively uh, react to situations that are what they haven't really been trained for. So just to reiterate, there are two kinds of expertise. Routine expertise involves mastering procedures in such a way that they become highly efficient and accurate, almost automatic, and that's system one reasoning, where there have been many stories where the, the uh, clinical expert works into a room and just by getting a sense of what the patient is presenting knows precisely what's wrong. So that's, that's a routine kind of situation. The adaptive expertise involves recognizing that something doesn't work that's been used routinely and begins to examine the problem, not only the problem, but the problem space as well. And it allows the clinician to begin to explore new concepts and invent new solutions right there in the, in the clinical encounter or in the practice setting. And that's system two reasoning. So what does it mean to be adaptive? Clinicians who function as adaptive, as routine experts, rely on what they have learned to match memory-based patterns with presenting problems and they become very efficient and proficient at what they do. If you're familiar with uh, Dreyfus' model of novel to expert uh, uh, and to master, uh, that pretty much describes the routine uh, expert uh, development. Uh, clinicians who function as adaptive experts must, experts must learn to navigate in situations where they're operating at the edge of their explicit knowledge. They learn to address novel presentations or surprises by resisting premature closure. Uh, what I mean by that is they resist relying on what they know now. Recognizing, um, they recognize that the routine solution may not work, and they challenge themselves to search for new insights and perspectives. I've been playing around with this for some time, and this uh, diagram, I think, uh, at least 
is my present understanding of what I think goes on. So when a clinician is confronted with a routine approach that does not seem to be working, and if she practices mindfully, uh, she will recognize that a gap exists between what she knows now and what she needs to know to address the fact that the routine approach is not working. This recognition causes cognitive dissonance, dissonance, that is, it creates a teachable moment, and if she's a critical thinker, she will identify assumptions underlying the routine approach. Based on the analysis, she will begin to consider alternative perspectives and decide to investigate new approaches. This will require planning, articulating the opportunity for improvement, identifying the change that needs to be made, and then locating a learning opportunity that will ena enable her capacity to make the change. She needs to then engage in learning, try out what was learned, and then implement it if it seems to work. So there are a whole range of assumptions in this scenario, as I'm sure you've uh, picked up, uh, some of which will be addressed, however, if, she prepa if she's prepared uh, for future learning. Others will be addressed by some of the uh, approaches that have been developed to um, address the concerns about assumptions that the authors have identified in that other article I mentioned. For example, informed self-assessment. Joan has done important work on that. The reliance on a coach, which is increasingly uh, becoming uh, uh, an, an option. Uh, Leslie Fall at Dartmouth has done some important work in that area and perhaps a portfolio that is part of an integrated digital network, which actually is one of my uh, academic fantasies, if I can use that term. So the conventional view, and, and what we're really talking about here is transfer. When somebody is working in a clinical environment, obviously their problem solving and their decision making is based on what they can transfer uh, from their uh, uh, long-term memory uh, what, what they've learned around that particular kind of uh, issue. So the conventional view is that clinicians who are using routine expertise are able to solve problems by applying previously learned skills and knowledge in new settings. And basically that's what to do and how to do it, better known as declarative and procedural knowledge. Um, experts transferred what they have uh, learned uh, when they recognize, that they recognize from their their training and in adaptive expertise, they not only transfer what to do and how to do it, but when to do it and why to do it. And so those are the principles and concepts that underline what um, what people do. And it's maybe it's called or it is called in some cases the deep learning that goes on uh, in in, a, in an educational activity also known as conditional knowledge. And I'm beginning to think more and more that there's an implicit, tacit, and situated knowledge uh, component to all this. And so that preparation for future learning adds conditional knowledge to declarative and procedural knowledge in learning activities that supports transfer. And so I think that the conditional knowledge is the key, uh, including um, when to do it, how to do it, those principles and concepts, in addition to uh, some situated knowledge that, that is picked up in uh, a learning experience. So I think it's important as we're thinking through how preparation for future learning applies to CPD that we begin to need to think about how we include this additional information to be sure that the situation, the situated knowledge, as well as principles and concepts, are provided to the uh, learners so that when they when they encounter a novel presentation, for example, uh, that these principles will provide them guidance for their uh, new learning uh, in the work setting. So, PFL. Uh, preparation for future learning is the ability to learn new information, make effective use of resources, and invent new procedures in order to support learning and problem solving in practice. As clinicians work, straightforward application of what they know is not necessarily sufficient to address patient needs, especially in situations of novelty and complexity. 
those who are able to do so because of preparation for future learning, work adaptively to provide the best possible care for their patients while gaining from the experience as part of their own continuous learning. And so that's the other piece of it. So the, um, the additional knowledge that's provided in addition to what to do and, and how to do it expands and develops while uh, individuals are learning uh, in ex from their experience as well. Adaptive experts are able to see the old and the new by using their past knowledge and finding the new and the old by reconceptualizing and evolving their practice as necessary. And this is the concept that Dan Swartz developed in his article in 2012, which shows how, um, how important it is not to have just the how to do it and uh, what to do and how to do it, but when and why to do it and that uh, situated knowledge as well. And Milopolis and Woods in 2014 used the double transfer design, which was a central part of the article that we read, uh, and found that medical students who received basic science and clinical instruction performed better at learning a new context when compared with those who received only clinical instruction. So the basic science in this case provided the when and why, as well as perhaps some of the contextual and um, some of the situated knowledge that helped these students uh, essentially transfer into a situation that they were not familiar with. Now they've talked about several approaches to uh, that uh, would help in terms of preparing people for future learning. And what I've displayed there on the screen is a challenge cycle that Bransford and Schwartz and other people while they were here at Vanderbilt in the early 2000s developed. And basically uh, in this model, uh, individuals, it's inquiry learning basically, where individuals are provided with a challenge with just enough information to begin to start thinking about um, how to address the challenge. Uh, they go through self-reflection and two sharing episodes in which they um, are able to uh, articulate what their reflections are been in terms of uh, strategies for addressing the challenge. In the multiple perspectives uh, area, um, faculty people see what they've been uh, uh, discussing because the work is captured on whiteboards. Um, they comment on what was right, what they could have included, um, and what um, might not be exactly right. And so they obtain, they obtain feedback, and then in the next phase, they're allowed to get back and discuss not only what the feedback from the faculty uh, was, but also uh, what the other uh, small groups have come up with in terms of their reflections and discussions. And finally, they go public at the very end, which means basically that they have incorporated all this information and um, are, are able to address the challenge uh, and come to some consensus on that approach. The issue here is not only are they dealing with the how to and the what, but the role of the faculty in the multi-perspectives part of this cycle is to ask them why, ask them when, and if the challenge is done correctly, there's enough of the uh, authentic environment in which this challenge is occurring to help them begin to uh, uh, understand the, um, the situation in which this, this challenge is situated and the knowledge that, and the contextual knowledge that's associated with it. And it seems that, um, the guided discovery, which is what this is, uh, helps trainees to begin to detect and activate their own knowledge during the early phases. Uh, that's the conceptual um, or the declarative and the procedural, and then be able to understand the conceptual and conditional through the interaction of the faculty person. So uh, we've gone through the first five items that of I mentioned I was going to cover and to wrap up um, my part of the of the presentation, um, the next steps that they think is most important, the authors think is most important, 
is to begin to determine which instructional designs encourage uh, preparation for future learning. So to develop an empirically grounded understanding of the adaptive expertise broadly, and then the, the, P, the preparation for future learning related behaviors specifically. So in the classroom, there may be studies, or the studies are needed to explore which instructional designs result in improved performance. And CBL is a possibility. CBL is a term that's used increasingly now for problem-based learning in uh, medical school settings. Uh, clinical, um, in the clinical setting, studies will be needed to explore how real-world adaptive expertise unfolds in the clinical workplace, and simulation should be considered in this area. And evidence is building that assessments that map onto authentic learning opportunities are po uh, powerful uh, educational catalysts uh, for developing preparation for future learning. So that's uh, my presentation, and I'd like to um, uh, turn it back over to Mila, who will facilitate uh, questions and discussion. Thank you, Don. Thank you very much. Um, um, this is a wonderful presentation, and uh, not only an outline and an overview of the article we all hopefully have read, but also I really appreciate you putting it into a larger context of our own literature and also our understanding of where this group of authors uh, really in, interact with us and where, how they have entered the field. So this is the time now to uh, open up this for discussion and um, we've structured it in a way that we have a few questions that we can pose but if at any time you feel that you would like to um, not only answer the question but contribute something differently please just raise your hand and let me know and I will um, unmute you. It looks like we may have, um, we don't have a raised hand, but um, so let me ask you, um, what do you all think about what is the preparation for future learning in your own view, uh, whether it's based on this article you've read or something else you've interacted with or um, something, um, some other thoughts you have. So I see that Tom has his hand raised. So Tom, go ahead. Uh, you are unmuted. Hi, Mila. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. Thanks. Don, uh, a wonderful job and excellent article and uh, a great introduction. Thank you. So my, my question, Don, is, I'm, and I'm still processing this, but I'm just wondering if, in fact, PFL is a distinct, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word, skill or competency, or whether, in fact, it's we're describing a situation where we have a true expert, someone who, you know, understands deeply her, his field, but who also knows you know, how to learn. I'm just wondering if, if if this is something different uh, from that or not? Uh, well, um, the authors uh, feel it's an it's a undeveloped competency, uh, and I, I can't disagree with them. Um, I think there is an aspect of um, learning to learn, um, but I think that what's clear from the literature that is primarily in the K-12 area and some in higher education is that uh, the uh, learning environment has to be constructed in a way that uh, provides the information to develop that new competency preparation for future learning. So I, you know, I think that's why at the end of this article they spent some time going through different kinds of um, learning and, and uh, learning strategies. And if you go back into the literature on which they have based their, based their article, it gets pretty um, detailed in terms of the kind of experiments that folks have done in the K-12 to uh, space. Um, and basically, the thing that comes out of that is that the learning environment has to be created in such a way that learners can develop this new competency. And it's... Uh, the issue is that additional information needs to be provided beyond just 
the what to do and how to do it. The conceptual the conceptualization behind what they're being taught, the principles that underlie it, and I think uh, we're beginning to realize more and more um, that the situation or the context is important as well. So I, th I think your question is, is on target, and I think that um, that it is, an, it is a competency that, um, our, that the authors feel is an important one and needs to be developed, and the learning environment is key in terms of making sure that the conditions are there so that uh, our learners can develop those that develop that competency. Thank you. Well, well thank you, Tom, and thank you, da um, Don. Of course, we have another question coming from uh, John. John Parvison, you are on. Please ask your question or comment. Thanks, Thanks Mayla. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, Don, thank you very much. A very clear presentation and uh, very easily sort of followed. Uh, but, you know, as you know, I'm from a previous generation, so I, I like to link to what I knew in the past, and, and all learners like to do this. Um, what is the difference between future learning and um, what we used to call lifelong learning? And on, on several occasions, I was asked to um, approach an a undergraduate curriculum and say, please list the areas in the curriculum that teach lifelong learning. Is, is there a difference between the two? Um, good question, John. Thank you. I think that um, I hadn't really thought of it in those terms, and I probably should have, but I think that uh, preparation for, cert for future learning is the competency that's required for lifelong learning. Uh, if you think of lifelong learning as not only being able to apply what you already have um, learned and is accessible, Re relatively quickly in your working memory, but also that which you need to pull out of uh, long-term memory along with the uh, contextual and, and other kinds of information. So I think that the thing that I think preparation for future learning does is help us understand um, how lifelong learning can go beyond um, just relating to the routine, getting improving, refining your routine expertise as well as beginning to develop adaptive expertise to deal with those uh, situations that may not be um, as familiar. Yeah, sure, yeah, it's obviously just sort of pushing the envelope a little bit further than just stating lifelong learning. C right. Can I just add something else? Um, again, going back to my past, um, uh, I keep r ringing up the concept of Schoen's um, uh, reflection, model of reflection in action, uh, um, which again the, the, the article doesn't mention any more than it mentions lifelong learning, um, and much of it is very much in your, in your graphics as, as well. Uh, I'd just like to take you, remind you of, take you back to the graphic with a number of steps, beginning with a challenge. Yes. And um, again, if you integrate sort of Sean's thinking into this, um, there's a step before the challenge, I think, which um, which is a very practical and tacit step, and, and that is um, you, your immediate response when you see a problem is, oh yes, I must have seen this before, and then you pick out the issues that are new and are worrying to you. Um, and so you're unpacking the, 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 the problem based on what you know about it already, uh, and then you come up with a challenge. Um, and that's, that's a skill which, which uh, as you know, um, needs to be taught, and you teach this by, by going through cases with, with the student or the resident. Um, and and I, I think that um, my experience with the residents in the past was um, the three most important words in medical education, I don't know. Um, and I think that they be able, be able to, to help students to identify what it is that's worrying them in a project, in a problem, a clinical case, and how do you identify from that what it is you don't know or what you need to know to solve the problem. And then you come to the challenge. Um, that was sort of my interpretation of what you said. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're but, exactly right. 
I'm beginning to investigate the whole field of perceptual learning a little bit more than I have in the past. And it's, uh, of course, like everything else, once you begin to scratch the surface, there's so much more there. So um, that's one of the next things I want to spend time on is to uh, really understand better what perceptual learning is and how important it is in exactly the situation you just described. How you actually move from automatic pilot to say, oh, I better look and see what's going on here. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that's, that's a new. Thank you very much, Lina. Mila. That's all I have to say. Thank you, John, and thank you, Don. Um, I just want to add that uh, to me it looks like this is this is connecting very well to some of the other discussions we've had, uh, be it in the journal club or even in the meetings. Um, for example, we had a session on workplace learning, which I think is very relevant here, and this is this is where we're going uh, with with these um, topics. Um, another one we had uh, Annette talk to us about critical thinking skills and how to develop those mastery tools that, that we're trying to develop in our learners in uh, whichever you know part of the educational uh, continuum they may be. So let me go to uh, Jan Balmer. Jan, you have your head ra uh, hand raised. Go ahead. Jan, are you, are you with us? Jan Balmer, you are unmuted. I think you have a comment. We seem to not be able to hear Jen. Uh, let's see. So Jen actually posed the question. Maybe I can ask for her. Dawn, can you speak to the role of scaffolding learning uh, sessions to foster the critical thinking that helps them move from system one thinking to system two thinking? That's Jen's question. So, Don, would you mind addressing that? A question. Um, you know, scaffolding is obviously when you uh, help a learner um, by seeing what, where he or she needs to go uh, or what you want him or her to learn, breaking it down into various components and then building the components uh, one upon the other as you uh, as you progress. Um, um, in the critical thinking area, I'm not too much of an expert on critical thinking, but I would think that um, you would provide opportunities for the learner with increasing difficulty as, um, as you proceed. So if, if you're working in a, um, an educational setting where you have the opportunity to provide uh, three or four or five scenarios, you can make the first scenario a little bit easier and progress in difficulty and complexity as, as you move forward um, in terms of helping the, uh, the student or the learner develop the critical learning, the critical thinking skills. Um, I think that's probably, uh, I'd like to hear from others in the audience maybe People have had more experience than I've had in terms of uh, working with critical thinking. Anybody else uh, would like to contribute to this particular question from Jan, as Don invited you? If not, we can move on to uh, other questions that folks have asked. So, um, Ala Pariccio is asking, do you believe, I, Don, uh, that, or anybody else on the call, on the club, that all medical students and residents have the ability to develop conditional knowledge? I think they have the capacity to do it. Um, I'm not sure that um, the way many of our learning activities in undergraduate medical education are structured in such a way that they can develop it. I think, that, I think that's part of the the message of the of the article that we need to think through our um, undergraduate preparation and uh, begin to think about less reliance on didactic and more reliance on uh, and learning activities where students are uh, forced to become more engaged in the learning activity itself 
and that this additional information is provided to them uh, so that they can um, uh, be prepared for future learning. Well, thank you. And then the related question also from Al is, do you think that conditional learning plays a role in systems-based practice or systems thinking? And in a way, you... Um, I think so. I think that yeah. part, of the, part of the systems issue, I think, is uh, I understand systems-based practice as uh, what goes on outside of the clinical encounter that impacts how the clinician and patient are able to interact and come to some agreement on what uh, the, the, the plan of treatment should be. So that's the situational kind of knowledge that I think is important for us to uh, begin to um, incorporate in our learning activities. So absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, thank you. Uh, Viejo Hade is asking if uh, pre preparation for future learning is a feature of individuals, teams, or systems. Um, good question. <laughs> um, people say good question when they always need time to think about what the answer will be. That's right. <laughs> um, I, I certainly think so. I haven't thought very much about how it could be used uh, in an interprofessional kind of learning uh, situation. Uh, Kathy Chapel would probably uh, attack me for that, but. Um, uh, I certainly think it, it could be, but I don't have any uh, uh, previously thought strategies for doing that. Um, I guess I need to work on my adaptive expertise. Right. Well, so I'm thinking um, it would have to start with a problem that is that is posed to the team, right? And then how to solve. Sure. I think, uh, you know, I think... I think of that. Yeah. Uh, doing an inter interprofessional education activity is, is not that difficult from a technical point of view um, in, in the sense that, so if you're working with a team, um, you need to provide that same information for each member of the team at, um, in their, their context in terms of how they work. Um, so uh, I think that um, it's certainly applicable uh, to inter uh, continuing interprofessional education as well as uh, CME or CPD. And um, it's just a question of being sensitive to the fact that you've got other people working in other settings uh, with other uh, issues that impact those that those conceptualizations and, and principles that underlying what's what's being uh, taught. System-wise, I'm not sure um, how it fits at this point, and I would be speculating at this at this point, and I'd rather not do that. So, but I think it is definitely um, applicable in the interprofessional space. Right. And if you think about the distributed distributed expertise within teams, that certainly um, is a concept that would contribute to um, additional in complexity. Well, distributed expertise is just a little bit different in the sense that each person has. Well, maybe it's the same thing that I'm, I'm talking about because it's each person with that working within a team um, has his or her own. Uh, expertise and it's recognizing that that's the key issue. Um, I've recently been reading a book uh, by General Stanley McChrystal. Um, I'm, I'm not really a very military oriented person, but uh, um, even though I am a veteran, but uh, the um, the what is important about this book? It's called Team of Teams and uh, New Rules of Engagement for a Complex World. And what he describes is what he calls shared consciousness, that he was able to organize his group into a team of teams 
where the people who were in command didn't need to command every single thing that they that they were that they were able to uh, delegate um, command decisions that were once made by the generals to people that are at a much much lower level in the hierarchical command. So they they flattened it out. And the reason I'm going into this at this point is that the idea of shared consciousness in a team, I think, is very, very important. Um, and so, and that that comes, I think, that um, that addresses the issue of adaptive expertise within a team. That a team then is um, capable or has the capacity and is permitted to make decisions that are on the ground uh, that are much more effective, say, from, a, from an efficiency point of view than if they had to go back up to the chain and then back down again to, uh, to, to uh, get permission to do something. So I, I think the idea of, of shared consciousness in a team, um, that could be a, a whole series of journal clubs on its own, but just wanted to bring that up in terms of the distributed expertise and applying the preparation for future learning uh, to a team because a, a team can't operate with that shared consciousness unless it's, unless it's prepared for future learning. Right. And I'm, I'm left with um, kind of what's ringing in my head is I don't know how many of you were at the Congress and heard um, the final presentations of Stephen Downs. Uh, there, but something that he talked about, um, you know, about how learning is personal and uh, that learning is in the doing, uh, really resonates well with, with these concepts and um, for me at least. So I keep thinking how um, there is something very tested about and, and personal and, and it's um, almost contrary to our understanding and focus uh, of not so recent, but certainly um, to, uh, into quality and performance improvement activities, which seem to push us into uh, standardized ways of, of doing things. And this is getting us out of it in a way. So I'd like to hear what others uh, think about that. And maybe bridging that to uh, you know, how do you see this playing out in our world in how do we design uh, learning activities as well as assessments because obviously assessment is a very important piece to this companion. So I'd like to open the floor again to all your wonderful thoughts. I'm looking for raised hands. So in your player you have a, an ability to raise a hand. Nobody's shy here. But if you really are, you can ask a question in writing, and I'll read it out. But it's nicer to hear your longer comments. Well, let me make a comment, uh, Mila, if you don't mind. And that is, I'd like people to think about the um, article that um, Ron uh, Severo uh, published in uh, late 2015 in the JSEP, in which he did a um, uh, a synthesis of uh, systematic reviews. And he identified um, five or six different characteristics of effective learning activities in CPD. Um, and let me just focus on two, which I think get at, at what you're trying to uh, get comments on. And that is that an effective learning activity deals with outcomes that a doctor is concerned about or a clinician is concerned about. Um, they are um, uh, interactive, they use multiple methods, multiple exposures to the issue, and they're longer. So if you think about that, if you have a longer, if, if activities are longer, let's just say you're thinking about doing a day-long activity, so you've got morning and afternoon, okay, so instead of doing eight lectures on let's just say it's diabetes for the full day, you take the morning or the take the afternoon, <clears throat> take the three and a half hours that you have in the afternoon 
and focus on one part of managing diabetes. And in that context, you can begin to do a series of scenarios that go across the entire afternoon and focus on issue, issues like situated learning, what, what the context is, focusing on concepts and principles. Uh, in each one of the scenarios, you can begin to alter uh, each one of the scenarios slightly so that you get a different look at it. Um, reduce the number of lectures and, and maybe have an introductory lecture and then break up the scenarios with chalk talks so that it's, it's a presentation but it's not a didactic and it's embedded uh, in, the, in the overall uh, issue that you're trying to uh, deal with. I think in that way um, you begin to get at some of the ways that we can begin to think about doing uh, preparing people for future learning uh, in the CPD setting, where they're, uh, where we have to do things differently, um, but we have the opportunity to provide that additional information that is connected with preparing people for future learning um, at the same time that we're giving them the capacity to deal with managing patients uh, who have a hemoglobin A1C over 9, for example, uh, in the various ways that they may present. Uh, so I think that's, that's one example of how uh, you might be able to incorporate um, uh, preparation for future learning in your current C learning activities related to CPD. Thank you, Don. Um, I think this also gets to uh, the part of the article that talks about the guided discovery, and that's not a novel concept. Um, to us, so um, allowing, creating spaces and environments in the learning environments where we allow learners to develop their own understanding of a problem to be solved and then uh, scaffolding or following, following that with, with directed guidance to, um, and then what comes out of that learning is really something useful that could be applied um, in the future. So I have Tom here and then John, uh, who have both raised their hands. Let me, uh, I'm going to go to Tom first. Go ahead, Tom, we can hear you. Tom Van Hoof. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, go okay. ahead. I, I was speaking, I guess. Uh, um, so Don, I think you're right on the money with respect to how important our educational activities are. and I. Uh, been reading a lot in the kind of learning science literature, which is, uh, I guess, overlaps a little with the CPD literature, but how important, uh, well, you know, longitudinal activities are very effective, particularly when they're spaced out over time. And I think that a lot of our, our meetings, our educational meetings, which understandably we, um, you know, cluster, you know, with uh, days on end, the problem with those is from a learning science standpoint, it often doesn't give us time for our brains to process information, consolidate, you know, important memories, and to find new connections. And so it may be that our, our regularly scheduled series kinds of meetings um, have the right idea, but we, as you described, we don't often use them. We, we treat them as a series of independent lectures or, or the like. And, and in, instead, we, we should be, um, uh, you know, uh, using the time to build on previous sessions and explicitly sequencing an activity that brings people along a continuum of change. And uh, so I just, uh, but I think you're right. The, the, I think how we structure the activities, I think, will be really critical about whether we're helping people develop, um, you know, this, this PFL competency. Yeah, I think that's a great a comment, Tom. Um, I don't. I don't know how many of the people on on the call here have uh, been following on on the Dr. Ed listserv um, the uh, conversation exactly about what you, what Tom just mentioned. And George Bardage uh, provided some interesting um, uh, support for what Tom is saying. And I think. That, that's a creative use of the uh, of the RSSs that we typically don't think are very effective, uh, but it's just because we haven't been creative enough with them. 
and, and admittedly, they're 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 not easy to change because they're they're pretty well ingrained, as I have found out on several occasions myself here. Um, but John Kelly, um, in an email I think on Monday or Tuesday, in Doctor on the Doctor Ed um, listserv, uh, cautioned us to be sure that if we're going to use the the spread out model, that we have to be sure that we have something going on in between the sessions mm -hmm. so that when we come back to the, to the session uh, that we don't spend most of our time recapping what we talked about in the first one. Um, mm -hmm. So I think again there's some, there's some issues in terms of how to manage that process as well, but basically he said that it's important not to, to make sure that the learners are, are doing nothing related to that time. Let me see, rephrase that. You don't want them to be doing nothing. <laughs> Let me start over again. <laughs> you need to have them doing something related to that content so they don't lose the momentum, I guess, of, of what you're trying to accomplish. Yes. Thank you. So I have uh, John Tarberson. Go ahead, John. Uh, just very quickly, uh, just to add to what both Tom and Don have been saying, Lila, um, I, I think there are new techniques that can be used to actually create a community, online community, um, uh, that's ongoing. Um, and things like uh, narrative corners where people can drop from an iPhone um, a, an experience that they've just had and it goes into an MP3 file and goes straight on the website. So there's always something there new for people to look at. Uh, but I think what you're trying to achieve is a true community um, or an online learning collective where you're building relationships and it's, it's really difficult to achieve that one day session as Tom was saying uh, <clears throat> and I think I think that um, also going back to my my voice of the past um, my shared consciousness uh, there's a whole literature on co the collective mind um, um, much of it authored by weeks um, and we see it almost every day in obstetrics where there's a a neonate that has to be resuscitated and half a dozen people around the table and each of them knows exactly what they need to do and they've done this because they've worked together and they've talked about it and uh, just last comment um, to make is that it was Etienne Wenger that says competency in practice is not just only doing the practice but being able to talk about it in such a way that you can share it with your team. Thanks for uh, give, give me an opportunity to to uh, to, to add to the discussion, Mila. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have one more comment, really quickly, from uh, Vieco Juarez. So, Vieco, go ahead. We can hear you. Oh, thanks. Uh, actually, it's not related with the previous comment. So, question is or comment is: Can we relate this with network learning? Because learning is often perceived as a social construct activity, and therefore, network learning as a concept that builds on connecting people with people, people with experts and people with tools can have great impact. I'm thinking when somebody can uh, tap into expertise of peers or mentors and can easily find access to relevant data, it is easier to, even, if, even if individuals, it is easier to start learning and changing behavior. Thank you for That's that question. Talk. Yeah. I I agree. It connects very well with what John has been working on for so many years, and that is the connectivity among uh, among uh, clinicians working in a particular area. I, I I think we don't take as full much advantage of that as we should, um, and some of us in CME um, should be spending more time on that. I know John has been working with Alvaro Margolis in, uh, mm -hmm. in Latin America, creating a very exciting. Uh, community of practice, and um, we just need to do more of that. Well, thank you so very much. Um, I, Before we close, I do want to thank um, uh, Don very much for his very thoughtful presentation, uh, he, as always. <laughs> uh, we always learn so much from you, Don, so thank you, uh, and for your willingness to spend time with us. Um, we all know you're busy. I also want to uh, thank all of you for your comments, thoughtful comments, and for joining in. We obviously have a group uh, that is becoming, um, you know, forming in this journal club and that gets together fairly regularly, and I, I really appreciate everything that comes out of this. 
I'd like to remind you all that the sessions are recorded, and if you've missed anything, you can find the sessions on uh, the SACME website in the journal section and in archived area. I would uh, invite you all to uh, uh, visit with us in the next two months. We have schedules outlined, so uh, I'm delighted to say that uh, this topic will continue, and in particular, uh, in the social aspects of learning with John Parbison next month, the 27th of May. Uh, we will have John visit with us, and Kurt Olson will be facilitating. The title is Learning from Each Other, Building Collective Minds and Other Behaviors Exhibited by Highly Effective Clinical Teams and Implications for CPD. A number of really interesting key articles um, uh, for you to look at and then discuss. And then in June, June 20th, Barbara and I will talk, uh, we'll lead the session on uh, professional identity formation. And I have to say I was delighted to be able to spend some time with uh, Fred Hafferty and, and um, had a brief interview with him recorded at the World Congress. So all of that is available on the website and, and we'll talk about that more in June. So with that, I'd like to Thank you all. Thanks, thanks, John, again. Um, and until the next time, have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.